Hey, Julian. How do you teach old dogs new tricks? I don't know, Mike. How do you teach old dogs new tricks? I don't know either, but I have a feeling that we're going to find out soon. <laughs> so do I. So let's welcome on Anita Dow from the website of mindfulpetowner.com. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. Hello, Anita. Hi, how are you going? We're good, Fine, thanks. how are you? Good. <laughs> Anita, it's great to meet you. you I'm too. Julian, and he's Mike. Hi, hi. <laughs> hi, Asla. Have you got a drink, though? Yeah, I've got some water. Okay, I can't be that'll, trusted that'll on... I, I, I don't want to put myself on to... I do Instagram lives with a glass of wine or gin, but um, wow. they kind of disappear yeah. straight I've, after. I've just, I've just got else. a water here. I'm just, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just got an empty glass. <laughs> you, need a, you need a drink. <laughs> we are we're completely professional. We are. Yeah, sure. As, as I believe, are you? In fact, you're two professionals, aren't you? Because you are a veteran professional. Mm-hmm. And you are also a, a training professional. You, you train people both via your your website uh, and and via your upcoming and developing dog behaviour. Yeah, job. yeah. So, yeah. So I currently do uh, dog training and dog behaviour consults. I've done a few different courses as far as dog training and I'm nearing the end of my companion animal behavior diploma so this time next year I'll be a qualified veterinary behaviorist um just to add a whole heap more letters behind my name I don't know why I do that to myself um but um yes yeah, so that's I split my time between uh vetting and my my business looking at the behavior and training what got you into that then, Anita? That's... Oh, a complicated little bean of a Frenchie that we adopted um, right. <laughs> ignited my passion for behaviour. Uh, she, yeah, she has um, had quite a few behaviour struggles, and um, I already had a good working relationship with our local behaviourist, and through working with her, that really ignited my passion and. Also through work, you know, as a vet, you see a lot of animals with, with behaviour struggles and some of them ultimately ending in not not a nice ending for the animal when it can all be avoided. Um, yeah. But, yeah, really, really, our little Daphne is the one that really set the fire alight in me to, um, to pursue behaviour and it's just opened a, a whole other world, which is, it's just so interesting and really rewarding. Mm. We we have a need for animal behaviourists and animal trainers, and as a as a profession, obviously clients will come to to us vets and say, uh, "Can I can I give you advice? Or, can, sorry, can you give me advice yeah. on, on my dogs doing this and that?" Uh, with the expectation that the vets are fully versed in in, in dog psychiatry, and we're not, yeah. are we? We, no. we? If you go to your average GP vet. Uh, then the wise ones will say, do you know, that's not my remit. Mm-hmm. I I, yeah, tell me what the problem is. Not, I'll see if it's a physical problem. I'll see if otherwise there's a problem that I know quite easily how to sort out. But otherwise, I'm going to refer you on to, to a behaviourist. But mm-hmm. there's, there are behaviourists and there are behaviourists, aren't there? There, there are a lot of people out there calling themselves behaviourists. Yeah, because it's you, not regulated at the moment. They're fighting no. to get that regulation. And that's why even now when people, you know, it's like uh, advanced practitioners versus specialists, you know, it's a very, it's very regulated and you can only give yourself that title, but at the moment it's not regulated at all. Um, that's why myself, I'm extremely careful when people, oh, you're a behaviorist. I'm like, nope, I'm not a behaviorist yet. Give me, you know, eight more months and yes, I will be. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm very careful about that distinction because while it's not regulated, um, it, it's heading that way, which is a really important, important move. Um, for the industry to protect clients more than more than anything um, to make sure they are seeing someone with the appropriate qualifications absolutely we don't want to i'm not dissing these dog whisperers so-called uh there are a lot of people without the necessary qualifications who for for whatever reason whether it's experience whether it's true knowledge they gained elsewhere 
have, I would say, a way with dogs or cats, but mm. it's not a true behaviourist. And so for clients uh, who are listening out there, um, and I'm sure the same is in America, most of our listeners are in America, make sure that whoever you go to for, for your uh, uh, behaviour uh, advice is uh, a recognised specialist in behaviour. Uh, we, we mentioned, you mentioned... Um, uh certificates and, and, and advanced practitioners just now uh, and there is a distinction in, in the, all levels of the veterinary field as there is in the medical field uh there are the so-called gypsies gps with special interests uh, mm-hmm. that, the, uh, that the doctors call themselves and, and i think vets are, are much the same uh, i i do an awful lot of orthopedic surgeries and spinal surgery i'm not a specialist and i make it very clear mm-hmm. when someone comes to me and says you could you fix my dog's leg? I hear you're a specialist. Said, no, 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 I'm not a specialist. I have an interest in it and I have a, an amount of experience in it, but I'm not a specialist. And if you're a specialist, here's a list of them and they will be able mm-hmm. to do uh, a much better job than me for you know, X number of reasons. Oh, I doubt that, Julian. That's yeah. pretty good to say. So you're just waiting for it to kick <laughs> in there. Yeah. And so, and so what, what advice would you, what letters would you look for after people's names? It really depends on where they've studied. And, and that's the biggest thing um, because you can do masters, you can um, do diplomas. There's there's an array of, of different letters that are going to be after people's names. But ultimately, depending on the country, there are governing bodies that, um, you know, generally all the accredited behaviourists are going to be members of. That being said, I think in the UK there's a couple of different bodies and you don't have to be registered with both of them. So it can be a little bit of a minefield that way because you you need to know what what you're looking for. Um, but ultimately the simplest thing would be to ask the person, you know, who have you done your training through and they should be able to, to supply you with, with, with something. Um, because it, it can be a little bit difficult. And if it's just straightforward, ask them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But in the majority of them, whether it's their website, business card, whichever, um, they'll have it on there. Because as soon as you, you've you got that accreditation, I know myself, like as soon as it, I've finished it, it will be on that website because I'll be proud as anything. <laughs> <laughs> These are my new letters. This is what I can do. I'm definitely, you know, qualified to do that and I'm qualified to call myself a behaviorist. Um, so it should be easily accessible information on their website or simply asking them. So how long is it? Do you have finals or is there a final assessment? You know, how long, how far off getting those letters are you? So I am two modules away. <laughs> the fifth, there's six modules, but the, I'm just about to start the fifth module. And this is through um, COPE South Australia, which is a fairly groundbreaking um, organisation within the animal behaviour area. Um, and a lot of um, the emotional assessments and things, they have created this standardised system, but also they are the ones who have come up with actually assessing mood states, emotional states of animals um, right. and helping bringing a bit more, a little bit more structure, but actually taking the emotional side of things into it for, for these animals. Um, and so, yeah, it's a six module course. I'm just about to start the fifth, but the final one is just writing up our case studies from cases that we've been working on and uh presenting those so um, yes module five should be fine it's all pharmacology which I got punished with during uni so <laughs> that shouldn't be too bad right so when, when do you expect to finish uh start of June so it will be I would say within the next eight months six right. to eight months because they like to give us quite a hefty break in between each module and I'm like like I could just power through and, and just let me get this done. But I think we've had two months break in between the end of the last oh. module and this module. So they really like to give you a bit of a rest. Um, oh. Whereas I'm like, I, I, I could get this done. Like, just <laughs> let me do it. Um, yeah, but it's nice to have a break. So so in about eight months time, you're hoping, which, which is probably a pretty foregone conclusion, that you're going to stick some extra letters after your name. And you're going to power mm-hmm. this onto a website. Mm-hmm. What is the website called? Uh, TheMindfulPetOwner.com TheMindfulPetOwner.com TheMindful... Okay. 
I've got it up on my screen now. It's a, it's a great website, and I love your blogs, by the way. We'll, we'll touch on them later. I, I do all that website it. myself, so I'll take any praise because that that website is the pain of my life. <laughs> it, <laughs> I'm not it's all that. great. So everything it's all takes great. me a long time. No, that's, that's really, so what, where did the idea, where did the whole concept for this come from? Um, I think, well, one, I was already um, on my journey becoming a, a behaviourist when I started this uh, this business. And as the, I suppose the byline on there is um, teaching humans to be the owners their pets deserve. And oh, even as a vet, that's a big passion driver of mine because I think a lot of Poor decisions get get made for for animals by their owners, and a lot of it is because they just don't know what they don't know. Um, and I wanted to try and find a way that I could share my knowledge, but in a more low key, less professional setting than in a in a, a consultation, basically. Um, sorry if you can hear my bulldog snoring. Um, <laughs> but and and that's what I find with whether it's the website through blogs or through Instagram. I do a lot of Instagram lives and Instagram stories, and it's there's part there is educational. Everyone on there knows I'm a vet, but it's also just my life as a very dedicated dog mum. That this is just. I keep it very authentic and real, not just Insta perfect. And I share my struggles on there with my girls and what I'm doing to help that and try and give out as much value and, and information on things as I can. Um, but really the passion drivers is, is just that, especially with behavior, a lot of things can either be avoided or they can be changed. They could be, any brain can be reshaped. And it's one of the biggest things that you see when you, have an animal come into the clinic or a consult room and they have all these struggles and the owner just thinks well, that's just how they are it's like they don't have to be like that all those dogs that are absolutely so scared that they're trembling and it's like they don't have to live their life like this it just saddens me to see like and they're always the ones that take the longest to recover from an anesthetic and you think this is the first time you've been truly relaxed in your entire life. Like that's this is why it's taking you so long to recover from a sedation or an anesthetic because they are just enjoying this, you know, this stress-free life for a couple of hours. Um, but it's just it's it's really is what it what what it says. You know, I, I want to try and teach humans to, to be the best owners that they can be, um, and that is through knowledge, is you know, sharing the information um, and helping them to make good choices really right it's interesting we because we can't do cognitive behavioral therapy on on dogs can we as such because we don't know their cognition we, we don't know their mindset to be able to change it so that the tool we have to use is the owner's interaction with the dog to change their mindset and that's basically i think what it all hinges on isn't it uh people who look after their dog's behaviour wrongly, or, or I would say wrongly, but in, inappropriately, react inappropriately to the behaviours that their dogs manifest. And I think also putting human emotions on it. Oh, they're just stubborn. Oh, they're ignorant. Oh, they're doing that to just to get back at me. It's like they are like, yes, they have emotions, but they are not that complicated. Like they did not remember that you only gave them half their breakfast six hours ago, and that's why they went and pooped in your shoe. Like you, you know, it's there's 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 such you know. I, I put animals in with children. You know, they're, they're the one of the two only purely innocent creatures on this earth. That nothing is vindictive. You know, there's no revenge. <laughs> well, that, that, but no, you, you're right. They are the, the, the innocent beings of this, and they don't plot and plan. You're right. They don't go, go around thinking, right, OK, next time he takes his slipper off, walnut whip in that one, mate. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I, I think it's just that misinterpretation and those really complex human emotions we put on there, but also the labels. And I think vets are just as, as guilty as putting labels on behaviours. And as I say to my clients, like, labels take away your power and they make you feel like there's no hope for your dog 
when they don't help anyone. <laughs> like, throw away the labels, you know, like, oh, he's a rescue dog. What does that mean? It's taking away your power. Like, the, every dog that, you know, you can help transform and reshape their brain. It's, it's labels help no one. And it's just, it, it's, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I know myself as a vet, the last two years of studying, I said, there's been multiple times where I think, oh my God, I've been telling people the wrong thing for like the last 13 years of my career or wow, I didn't know that. And yeah. it's completely changed how I work in the clinic, but it's also part of well, a big reason why I work in emergency and critical care now is because those patients, they need it. It's life or death. I have to just handle them how I need to handle them for that. But I moved away from general practice because I could know longer feel comfortable about what I had to do to vaccinate some animals or unnecessary things or you know as simple as a nail clip I don't want to be giving this dog a nail clip when it takes two nurses to hold it and and you know all these things that we actually make worse but it's kind of the pressure from the point well, why can't you just do it just hold them and clip their nails it's like the emotional trauma that I'm causing this this animal and so for yeah. me I had to step away from general practice because I still love being a vet but there's so many things in, in day-to-day practice that unless you've got someone running a clinic that is to really, um, you know, they're passionate about behaviour and having fear-free clinics and force-free and, and you're allowed that time, the appropriate consult time to do that, it's unrealistic to be able to get a behaviour-friendly clinic. Um, and so I just had to step away from general practice because I couldn't morally well I couldn't put myself through that and I couldn't put my patients through that just because I was like I know better now and I don't have the power to change my consult times but I have the power to change which area I work in instead yeah because it's impossible to have any sort of behavioral discussion in a in a 15 or 20 minute consult time isn't it yeah yeah and and allowing those dogs that once they have time just to acclimatize they're much more relaxed but 10 or 15 minute consult you don't have you don't, you can't, that's just not possible. Yeah. Um, is, there, is there anything else you particularly like about emergency medicine, Anita? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a particular interest of mine. Yeah, no, I, honestly, I thrive being busy. <laughs> I like right. being busy and I like the unpredictability um, mm-hmm. of it and the, the challenge of it. And I do really like the... The, the teamwork as well because when something walks in the door whether it's bleeding gasping for breath it's just all hands on deck and it's a well-oiled machine and I love working in a team like that where when stuff, stuff hits the fan you, you've got a team there and everyone just gets in everyone knows their role and you're all there on the same page working to try and save this animal um so I, I do really like the more complicated things. I've, I've got my cardiology certificate as well, so I don't do very much right. of that anymore. Um, but you know, it's the I you know the different surgeries and the medical cases. It's I thrive on the more complicated, and that's mm-hmm. what I get with emergency and critical care. Are, are the times that you don't like? Um, I well, I am moving away from working night shifts and more working weekends and bank holidays or back shifts because especially during the pandemic where we're all so socially isolated I was finding the night work even more isolating and um and that's one of the parts I I don't like and you know I'm only 36 but I'm getting too old to work nights (laughs) (laughs) it takes me longer to recover because night shifts generally they're 15 hours and you're not guaranteed a break because a lot of time the overnight shift, it's you and a nurse, maybe an animal mm-hmm. care assistant. And it's so hard on your body, you know, physically, emotionally, mentally, it's it's draining. Um, and you're not guaranteed any kind of, of break. You could work a 15-hour shift and, you know, go to the toilet twice and jam some food down your, your, your throat. Um, but I like, I actually like being that busy, but it's just with, my body's not recovering as much <laughs> as well. It's taking longer yeah. to recover, but also with the pandemic, it's just going to work is the only time I've been able to socialize. So it's like, I think mm-hmm. I'd prefer to work the weekend day shifts and, and the bank holiday day shifts or the busier clinics that have multiple vets and multiple nurses on just so 
it's that bit more of a, a social element there rather than it's just me and my nurse and that, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, 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 working nights upset your sleep patterns as well, doesn't it? And uh, we, we all and it's know. It's so because I would do a night shift and I'd normally, because I travel around a lot for, for my particular position and I would only, maximum I would do would be two nights in a row and right. but even so whatever however many nights I've done in a row when I finish at say nine o'clock that next morning I stay awake for the entire day until I go to bed at a respectable time about eight or nine p.m and then I'll have a bit of a sleep in the next day because that's how I can get back into my normal rhythm yeah. um but normally by eight or nine o'clock that night I'm talking gibberish and it's you know yeah. but because I'm terrible at napping like I've never been able to nap. My husband knows I'm not feeling well if I say oh, I'm going to go have a nap because I'm incapable of napping. Like I say, yeah, okay, I'll lie for 20 minutes. It takes you 20 minutes to fall asleep. And then mm. five hours later I wake up and then my sleep pattern is completely out yeah. of whack. So like I, I just can't nap. I'm just, it's one of, it's not on my CV as one of my skills that I have. I, I can't nap. So <laughs> it's just, I finish the shift and then I stay awake all day and just force myself back into that normal pattern otherwise you could very easily become a, a night owl yeah yeah and that's uh yeah it's a, it's a well-known torture technique isn't it yeah, <laughs> yeah. Technique is to keep everybody everybody awake and uh, it, it is it is although i have to say as, as a as an employer if i see i'm a great napper on the cv i may not push that one forward too much <laughs> <laughs> i know right <laughs> Although, although actually it, it makes sense doesn't it maybe we should be maybe we should we can explore that later but uh, mm. I'm, I'm a i'm a hopeless napper but the times i do have a nap as you say well i'm ill uh, and i need one or i'm so dog tired i have one and then i have a 15 20 minute nap and four hours later i'm still going oh i haven't quite woken up yet well, yeah exactly whereas mm. actually my um my father-in-law has done some kind of hypnotherapy course and he can have a five to 10 minute nap and wake up and feel bright as if he's had a whole night's sleep. Like he did wow. some hypnotherapy course in it and it's amazing. Like he can fall asleep like that and five or 10 minutes wake up like he's had a full night's sleep and keep going. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now that's a skill. That's one to put on the CV. Yeah, it is. Amazing. That's amazing. No, I thought of having a hypnotherapy course uh, that, that uh, taught me that I could actually sing. <laughs> and maybe that would improve my singing because yeah, frankly it's painful for anyone around me yes that didn't go too well did it no no, no. but you th you you're I'm happy sure there's someone out there who does like your singing voice. <laughs> Do you know, my, my singing teacher does but i think i think it's just because i'm paying her yeah <laughs> <laughs> probably probably she, she hasn't figured out the, the the feedback sandwich yet she's just all positive so there's just she's no, all positive no there's no yeah there's no you yeah. could do better it's, oh oh that's oh that's wonderful no 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 that's no, really good that's really good now i'm having to put my prices up a little bit actually because i, I need more uh, uh ear blockers but um yeah, that's really good yeah <laughs> I, I, I reckon I, I reckon i could do that for you julian uh, I, okay. like, I like the way that you set your diaphragm to breathe in there. Unfortunately, the noise that came out was absolutely terrible. Um, <laughs> but you kept a nice smile and your eyes were open and you did approach the audience. So I, I think that was very good, Julian. So let's keep that up, shall we? Maybe miss out. See, the I, I've already forgotten the negative part that you said. So that works really well. <laughs> that's, 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 I, I only got diaphragm. That's great. I'm, I'm, well, I'm pleased go. with that. I'm pleased with that. There we go. Feedback sandwich. <laughs> Feedback sandwich. <laughs> Anita, tell me, I understand that you haven't always wanted to be a vet. <laughs> well, look, it's the majority of my life, yes, but um, I first decided I wanted to be a vet. I think I must have been either 11 or 12. Um, right. And so prior to that, um, I remember my school teacher ask me everyone one day as they do in school what do you want to be when you grow up mm -hmm. and I very confidently told him that I wanted to be a supermodel right. and <laughs> I like yeah Cindy Crawford I was like yeah I'm gonna be a supermodel um and and he very politely you know very diplomatically was like yeah, well, you know you could be that but 
you know, you're quite intelligent, you get good grades, you think maybe you want to do something else. And I said, okay, well, I'll be a vet then. And like, <laughs> it was just from one to the other, but it's one of those things where like, you know, they do those tests and they find out what side of your brain you use more. I've always been like a 50-50 and that's just a perfect example of supermodel to vet. But I never strayed from that. Ever so, again. so like li- you could ask anyone while I was growing up, always been a vet from that time. Mm-hmm. So literally from the sublime to the ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really well paid and luxurious and lots of freebies to hmm. <laughs> to, to supermodel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But mind you, I, I wouldn't want to be a supermodel because you you'd, you'd rub shoulders in with Elle McPherson. Uh, and um, no, there was wouldn't. a time. No, you wouldn't. There was a time when I would no, love Julian, to do that. You, you, no, do you no, not Julian, anymore? Julian, no, 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 Julian. Huh? You, what? you would not rub shoulders with El McPherson. You might rub well, shoulders with Elle McPherson. No, no. Listen, El McPherson. She's six foot bloody she, three. She is. You're right. You're only five foot four. If, if I stand on a box, I'd rub shoulders with her. Yeah. 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 See, also now that my problems, like I wouldn't have been tall enough. If it wasn't for my height. There we go. There we go. So with, with this dramatic with this dramatic career change then, we turn the clock back to let's say, well, probably not eleven year old self, but well, maybe we could. So if you were going to write a letter now advising your younger self, can we pick an age here? Should we do eighteen or should we do eleven? Just, just do eighteen. Do, just 18. do eighteen. Okay. So yeah. if you're going to write a letter back to your 18-year-old self, full of the knowledge and with with wonderful 360-degree multicolour vision, hindsight, what, what, would you, what advice would you give your 18-year-old self? Well, funnily enough, when I was 18... <laughs> Go on. You, you got I a letter 12, from someone took, who was saying that they I were for you and they were 36. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I took 12 months off from my vet degree. So I started my first year and then I actually took 12 months off. Right. Um, and it was my mum who convinced me to go back to uni. <laughs> so the first thing in the letter would be saying, listen to your mum. Right. <laughs> Going back to uni is the right choice. Because, <laughs> um, again, that at that point I was like, do I want to do music or do I want to do vet school? Again, it's like those two sides of my brain are always – Mm-hmm. boring a little bit um so yes the first thing would be listen to your mum it's a really good choice to go back to uni mm-hmm. um I think ultimately all my choices up to this point I would I wouldn't take anything back at all yeah. I love mm-hmm. my career and I love my life and it's all those hiccups and heartbreaks and whatever else, those bumps in the road, they got me to where I am. And I suppose not even my career got me to Turkey in a random place. And that's where I met my husband. So it's every choice that I make, whether it it was the right one or not at the time, I would still make them 100% make them all again um, to end up where I am now with, the person I am now and I'm really sorry but I'm hopelessly romantically in love with my husband after eight years <laughs> um yeah. but and, and that's one reason why I would not redo anything um mm-hmm. because where I am now is exactly where I should be as far as my profession I think for me it's I put a lot of importance on being busy and um, putting value in being busy. And so Mm -hmm. I definitely at points overworked myself. And, you know, I think skills that I would put, try and teach myself and know that it's okay to to slow down. (laughs) It's okay Mm -hmm. to slow down. Um, You don't have to be able to do everything. Um, And knowing listening to the signs that you you're getting burnt out because I think you know I've never been good at you know push 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 and that's Mm -hmm. (laughs) probably something I got from my mum um (laughs) but I didn't notice the 
early signs that I was starting to get run down, burnt out, exhausted until my body started screaming at me with all these ailments um, when actually emotionally I wasn't in tune enough with myself to go, right. actually, you, you need a break, you need a break, you need a break. Um, and so, yeah, I think teaching myself then, you know, how to actually slow down, take a break, mm-hmm. you don't have to be super busy. Um, but everything else, you know, I think I wouldn't change anything else, but definitely trying to teach myself that to slow down, slow down, down. go go a bit easier on yourself more than anything. (laughs) It's, it's something that that we're not very good at as vets, isn't it? We are, we're the classic overachievers. We're the always get good grades, always expect to get good grades always expect to know the answer and always want to do the right thing for the owners. Owners come to us, they want us to get things right and we do it and we beat ourselves up too much when we don't get it right, when we can't get the answers. And that has catastrophic consequences sometimes, doesn't it? Uh, And I know that that you've you've mentioned this several times on your blog um, and and I I won't, um, I think, hesitate to bring it up, but, but, but there is a huge mental health issue around the whole profession uh, that that we we just don't talk about. Um, Yeah. Well, we talk about it within the profession. Well, we kind of do. We say there is one. We don't say But we're not trying to talk about it with the general public. You know what I mean? And and that's, I'm chatting with um, some friends at the moment to try and get something moving, I I suppose, for (laughs) for lack of a better description, because I Mm. feel like, it's everyone within the profession is aware of it and some people feel more comfortable talking about their struggles and others don't um but it's such an unknown within the general public like so many people you'll tell them you know statistics or whichever and they're like I had no idea it's like well that's the problem like what it's like it's trying to be dealt with as an internal problem rather than an external, you know, trying to get help from it, external sources. It is, because we must always present a brave, all-knowing face to the public, can't we? If we show any vulnerability, yeah. then they'll think, gosh, we yeah. can't do our job. That's that's the feeling, isn't it? There's also the thought yeah. that if we, don't, if we don't do something, if we take time off, if we say, no, do you know what, I can't do that, we're letting our colleagues down, we're letting our clients down. And that yeah. that's a, a huge pedestal to have to uh, that, that fall off. That feeds on itself doesn't it yeah and I I know myself it's like someone goes tell me how you know go and eat something and I'm up there emotionally feeling bad while everyone else is still down there working like I should be going doing that I'll just jam this down I'll go down it's like but they're all going to take their lunch break at some point but I'm up there and I'm like I just gotta eat really fast just so I can get down there because like the guilt that you feel that Mm. you're having a break and the other people aren't um or you know, during your day, it's, and I think not taking a break. And I try to explain it to my husband. It's like, I have the problem that an animal comes in and they need my help. Who am I to prioritize myself over this animal's welfare? And and it's, you know, it's such a, you know, it's a struggle because sometimes, you know, it's, it is very clearly, you know, this animal needs to come first. And other times it's like your nurses will have to literally go, this can wait 10 minutes, go and sit down, go to the toilet, have a drink and have something to eat. But if someone's not there to actually tell you, then it's just that mental struggle of, well, is me looking after myself more important than me looking after this innocent animal? It's, it's just that, that internal struggle that happens. It's a very fine line, isn't it? It's, it's, mm. it's a question of the who cares for the carers. And if you, mm. if you don't take that moment out, because you, we've got that very fine line between success and failure, life and death, health and, and illness, and we're, you're dealing with that with a patient all the time, that critical decision that needs to be made, if you haven't taken time for yourself, you might make that wrong decision or you might yeah. make that mistake. Yeah. And that is then going to be consequently even more catastrophic for the patient. And then you've got that guilt burden laden on the top of, 
of everything. And, yeah. and quite frankly, you're probably not fit to be doing your job. Mm. And yeah. that's, the, that's the internal struggle, isn't it? Because mm. of course you're fit for doing your job. You're more knowledgeable than most of the other people around. You're more skilled than most of the people around. And, and you are perfectly suited to doing that job. You were just yeah. a human. You were a human for a moment and made a mistake. Not because you're incompetent or inept, but because you haven't taken time to take that moment, to take that breath, reset and go again. And it's, it's, yeah. it's an interesting question. And it? I know, like, I struggle. Like, I would be the one to make sure everyone else is getting their breaks and because yeah. I used to, you know, be in charge of 30-something staff. And it's like I would make sure yeah. everyone else got their breaks. I would stay late. I'd clean kennels, wash floors, you know, to make sure that the nurses weren't staying back in time. But, you know, there are times where I would get drive home from work and my husband would literally be waiting for me because I'd call him on the way home, tell him how sick I was, and I wouldn't have eaten all day and I would literally collapse in the driveway and I'd be sick. Like I would be sick because my body was just yeah. absolutely rejecting what <laughs> yeah. because you've had yeah. no water, you haven't been to the toilet, you haven't eaten anything, it's 15 hours later and, you know, you've done a 40-minute drive home and migraine and yeah. then you pull up and you're just like, but, and he, you know, he's had to carry me in the house because sure. I physically couldn't get in there. And and yet still in my brain, it's like, if I looked back, at what point should I have taken a break? I don't know. Oh, yes. It was, <laughs> like, four, so it was four years ago. I know now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, and you yeah, can bet exactly. that if the phone rang at that time and it was all Mrs. Jones with her shih tzu, you'd summon a deep... Uh, well yeah. of strength from someone oh yeah no oh, poor poor little puppet how's it doing yeah no problem i'll, I'll be right out i'll see it yeah see yeah it. Exactly. and that's what we do yeah. and that's what we do yeah have you um you, so this this hopefully is in the past these uh these collapses on the drive and these awful times you, you've you've developed presumably some strategies to to get by it to cope to to make it better now so the worst of it was in a really bad job and I, you know, I was there four weeks, handed my notice and I was out of there because it was run ridiculously. And that's when I was like at, at the worst. And, and I would like to say that I learned from that and I had to literally get to rock bottom before I learned. And my last job where I was running clinics, it got to the point where you know, I was trying to run everything and I was full-time clinical as well as running four clinics. And, you know, I was stretched that thin, um, partly through my fault and partly through <laughs> the higher level levels mm. fault because, you know, I'm a bit of a control freak perfectionist and everything else. Um, but it got to the point where I literally just broke down at work and all it was was this, you know, slightly rude email from one of my colleagues and I literally just collapsed in the fetal position and started crying and oh. I I walked out and I never went back um I and I would have you know over that four years of working you know looking after clinics it would be every three to six months I would just take them into health day because I would wake up and I'd like but I'd let it would just be a cycle you know I'd get to fever pitch and then just have a little bit of a meltdown and just have a day off work. But then it got to this point and I was like, you know what? I couldn't go back in. Like I, I was off two months on stress leave. And then in the end I had six months off the professional together. And um, because I was having panic attacks, I could, I physically, I wow. drive, drive to the clinic to go and speak to my practice manager and talk about whether or not I was coming back. And I'd have panic attacks on the way there. I, I couldn't physically take myself to the building. And wow. so I had six months off the profession and it was the best thing I ever did because I had six months to reevaluate my life right. <laughs> essentially and get my priorities in, in order. And ultimately the priority is me over anything else. And I did start a new job in, in general practice and the second weekend I realised I'd walked into an extremely toxic environment and I went into them and I said, this is not for me, I'm out, I'm, I'm not staying here. It's like I've spent six months getting myself together. I'm not working in a place like this. Um, 
you know, to undo all the good work I did for myself. And a lot of that is through, you know, um, having coaches and, um, you know, practicing a little mindfulness and yoga and, and Mm -hmm. things like that. But I've sorted my priorities out and, um, you know, my home life is what comes before anything. Whereas I was putting my work life before everything Yep. And it was having a detrimental effect, knock on to, you know, me being cranky or not wanting to talk about things or, you know, it would take me three days on holiday before I finally relaxed and got back to what my husband calls normal Anita, <laughs> you know, this yeah. really fun, loving, easygoing person because you're so snowed under with everything. Um, and so now for me, I've now that I've gone back to vetting, I'm part time that was really important to me. I'm going to go back part-time and I'm going to focus on doing something that I want to do. Um, that is, it's less, um, it's, it still has definitely behavior cases are emotionally taxing, but I'm focusing on something for me. And especially, you know, there's a lot of baggage with what actually happened with my, my previous job. But, um, at the end of the day, I got my point and I'm like, it doesn't matter how hard you work for someone else. You're always just a name and a number on a page. And I said, I'm never going to work that hard for anyone again, unless it's for me mm-hmm. and my husband. Yeah. So definitely going part-time has made a huge difference. And I'm better at, at taking those, those breaks and actually listening to my body rather than ignoring those physical cues that, um and you know I didn't realize that I took six months off and I'd been dealing with anxiety probably for the last four years and I didn't even realize until I got over it and I thought oh that tightness in my chest that's not normal which I just mm-hmm. lived with non-stop or I shouldn't be bloating after every single meal or you know I shouldn't be all these I shouldn't be having it oh I don't no longer have those heart palpitations like it's all these physical things for me just went and I thought Nita you've been really bad like <laughs> not listening to to yourself and so it, but it wasn't your wake fault. up call but it, yeah. that wasn't your fault no yeah no none of it you found yourself in that spiral and and that situation and again it's it's a case of being able to forgive yourself for being human yeah and that's yeah, that's that's an important thing. I think. Mm. So, because let's get this into context. Uh, vets are our leaders. We are the world leaders yeah. in suicide, mm-hmm. and that's that's not a, a great record to have, is it? Uh, no, not at all. Four, four to five times more likely than the general population. We only narrowly beat dentists, uh, but we mm-hmm. do beat them. Uh, and it, it's it's a huge problem. Uh, I was saying to Mike last week. I, I recently did a a mental health first aid course, uh, which was absolutely fantastic. My only hope is that I don't ever have to put it to use because I'd rather hope that my my staff, my friends, my colleagues, everyone I meet, don't need me to help out yeah. because their lives are okay. But I think we we all could do with with admitting that we have stresses in life. We all do with admitting that actually we we need time out. We need to talk. We need to yeah. say actually no. Do you know this this really isn't okay? Yeah. When we ask the question, "How are you doing?" and someone says, "Well, you know," and our heart sinks because what we wanted was the answer. Yeah, I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> yeah. We need to be able to say actually not just how are you doing, but how are you doing. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And that little bit of time could could make all the difference to someone's whole life, literally, yeah. their life or not. Yeah. Um, and that's why, look, I'm proudly wearing. I don't know if you can see it. I'm proudly wearing oh, this vet badge. Life badge. Oh, yeah. A vet <laughs> life badge. There we oh, go. Yeah. It's, a, it's a lifetime member. Um, Vet Life is only one of many organisations that, that, that help professional people. There are lots of other uh, non-professional organisations, lots of other uh, sources of, 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 uh, of help, and lots of other sources of self-help. Um, you had to reach rock bottom, Anita, and I'm sorry that, that that was the case for you. I'm glad you've made it back. Uh, there are many yeah. people who, 
who don't. Uh, and I'm hoping that, 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 that even, even if one person hears this podcast and takes notice of, of some of the wonderful, positive things that you said uh, and makes a change to their life without having to reach rock bottom, then it's worth all the episodes we've ever had to, to do that. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing nice. your journey with us. Awesome. It would be nice. It would be nice. Yeah, my sister does, but maybe she's not near rock bottom. <laughs> no, my, um, my best friend in Australia, she is a fairly recent graduate vet. I think she's about three years out now, and we originally met when she was working with me as a vet nurse. And when she was getting ready to graduate, um, the one I drew, she because she came over to England for a month and did some scene practice with me. And the one thing I drilled into her that many times, like when you graduate, you go and you find a counsellor, a therapist, whichever, and you book in to see them every one to two weeks. I said, whether you feel like you need it or not, you need it. You need to learn to talk to someone and just whether it's about work or not, but you need someone. And, you know, and she went there and she's like you're absolutely right but it, it helps being able just to get in that habit of talking to someone um because it it makes a big difference a big difference just being able to to talk and you know you know my my husband is my <laughs> saving grace it was always a thing I'd come home from work every night write it all out and then okay good <laughs> but it's having <laughs> someone to talk to yeah. It makes a huge difference who's able mm. to listen and not try and necessarily fix, but it's just having someone to, to listen that you can just, <laughs> just uh, word vomit. Absolutely. It's it's the listening. The listening is a huge thing, isn't it? We, yeah. we yeah. often you know listen to a friend talking, don't we? We, we don't we don't often really listen, and that's listen non-judgmentally and without wanting to butt in and say, Oh, do you know I had that? That's fine, yeah. Uh, no, yeah. no, or trying to fix it that. as Sorry. well. Like or I'm bad. Like I, I'm, I'm a I'm a fixer, and it's mm. like one thing that I'm trying to work on is like you don't need to fix everything. They just need someone to listen to. Just listen. Cool. Mm-hmm. Cool. Fine. Well, uh, wow. I've learned a lot. I've learned, I've, a lot I've learned huge amounts. Thank I've you. Loads tonight. I, could could you learn any more? Do you think, Mike? Maybe if we've got a minute. <laughs> oh, the pressure! <laughs> <laughs> you know what we're talking about, don't you, Anita? We're talking yeah, about yeah. Your, C- your segue is not subtle enough. <laughs> <laughs> Sixty second CPD. So I, I take it you've heard of sixty second CPD. Yes, yes. I, I, I wrote my notes CPD? down. I'm prepared. That's, I'm that's, loving this. That's brilliant. That's amazing. <laughs> okay, so so Anita now. 60 second CPD, what subject do you want to cover? Um, turning puppy socialization on its head. Okay, all right. So, let's so turning this. puppy socialization on its head. Mm-hmm. Right, so, let's get the clock up. So, Anita Dow, the mindful pet owner, oh, the turning. Puppy socialization on its head, one minute starting from now. Okay, so socialization in the traditional sense is getting your puppy out and about so they're exposed to lots of different people, dogs, and environments. But what are we actually doing? We're exposing them to the novelty. The concern with this traditional method is that so much of this is out of your control and it can very quickly become a negative experience. And it only takes one negative experience to undo a hundred positive ones. Get yourself a big cardboard box, a washing basket or a paddling pool and start collecting your clean recycling. Your puppy can search through these looking for treats or kibble and this has the exact same effect. They are being presented with novelty but in a controlled environment, paired with food making every experience a positive one, resulting in a dog that is optimistic and confident with novelty, a skill that will be generalised to other novel situations, objects, people or dogs. Do the groundwork at home and don't rush into taking them everywhere and meeting everyone. Three seconds left. Come on, fellas. Come on. No, that Nailed was it. fantastic. Wow. That was amazing. That was wow. I'm absolutely blown away by that. So socialization isn't necessarily meeting new people, going to new streets. It's actually uh, it's seeing novel about things. Novelty. Yeah. About novelty. And it's, 
as opposed to so all puppies are born optimists you know, they're glass half full but as life goes on experiences happen and they become more pessimistic um just like humans and just like as older dogs get on oh yeah they, they bark at the postman or they bark at this noise or they don't like this dog um but as puppies we have we're starting with this clean fresh canvas of spaghetti brain and by controlling their um, experiences with novelty we're just promoting optimism and confidence in the face of novelty and what you what we would call generalization we call like brain flexibility is that they can transfer a positive experience with novel things to other novel experiences because novelty in general is good it's not scary um and whereas this. it's it's yeah. really common that dogs puppies they've been out and about and they've been you know taken on walks for a month or so and they suddenly get a sudden aversion to their lead and harness mum or dad picks up the leader harness and they run and it's not because anything bad happened with the leader harness it's because those walks have been too stimulating too arousing and something that they didn't feel positive about happened but they associate it with that lead and harness and it's because they're going too hard too fast um and so by doing it at home you can build up and you know like oh they need to learn how to you know we need to teach them how to communicate with dogs like are you kidding i'm a human i speak human i don't speak dog like dogs are born knowing how to communicate with other dogs we don't need to teach them like it's ridiculous that we think we teach them how to communicate um but it's that that optimism and and confidence with with that that novelty situation which they will then generalize to other situations um but also teaching them that that person that dog is none of their business you know there's nothing worse than having a dog you know it might be cute when you've got a you know a 12 week old labrador puppy who wants to jump up and meet everyone but you've got a 45 kilogram adult labrador at the end of the lead who thinks every single dog and every single person is his business and that can, is what happens, you know, as a result of that traditional socialization because you've taken them to meet every single person or dog that walks past. And so they think every dog and every person is their business when actually it's it's such a stimulating environment. And it's like so mm. when they come to the vet clinics, if they're what we really want is a low arousal positive experience because as soon as their mental arousal goes up here, even if it's positive, it takes the smallest negative thing to flip them over into full-blown, high arousal negative. And so what might have been a crunching of a leaf that if their arousal was lower and they would have went, what was it? oh, it was a leaf, it's okay. It's gone. My arousal's already up here. This scary leaf happened. And, oh, my God, it was the worst thing ever. I never want to go for a walk again. So it's there's a lot going on at, at puppies, but, and it's just it's a new way to think of things. Um, oh, but... Mm. yeah that's yeah. that's amazing it, it, it makes perfect sense but i i'd never i'd never ever thought of it and that's what my, my, all my clients like they go i've never heard that said before but like it really makes sense i'm like yeah it makes sense yes it makes sense I, I, mm. um can i go back to puppy training school i'm particularly liking the food yes absolutely <laughs> yeah, me too me too a treat in every box sounds fantastic yeah. Yeah, well, actually, all like the the training that we do, um, we ditched the dog bowl eighteen months ago. Our dogs haven't eaten out of a bowl in eighteen months, and that's because we use their kibble for training. We use their kibble for enrichment. So we, um, and that's what I do with my clients as well. Is that you've got this pot of value every day that you can use for training for rewarding good decisions. You don't need high value treats like you've got this huge pot of value that you can use um, and just reward them making good choices. But, you know, you know, th there is studies that show that dogs prefer to work for their food, contra freeloading. They prefer to work for their food, not eat out of a bowl. And if given the choice, they will choose to do an activity and earn their food than eating out of a bowl. Um, but even, you know, a lot of these um, activities that I do with puppies, like say, the cardboard box with lots of different activities or a paddling pool with ball pits and, and things like that 
you get older dogs who start to, we might say they've got a bit of dementia or, you know, they're getting old. You get them involved in those types of activities and you'll see a complete change in these dogs, complete change. And it's amazing because we kind of think, oh, it's just old age, but you get this stimulation happening. You work on turning their pessimistic brains into optimistic brains, introduce confidence and and get them working mm. on these same things that you get puppies working on. Like our, our, I say our girl, our oldest one, she's six and a half, but she's an English bulldog. So let's be honest. So she's, <laughs> she's okay. getting older. All this. Um, All yeah. yeah. So, and a year and a half ago, like she used to play a lot in, as a puppy, but we started playing all these games with her because I do games based training. Um, all these games that I was playing with my other two and she's reverted back to her puppy self. She wants to work for her food. She wants to play. She's loving life. And we've changed nothing but the way we deliver her food. And it's, it's so there's, you know, there's a lot, just as much we can do for old dogs as we can for young dogs um, with games based training and, and enrichment that will have a huge huge effect on on their their mental capabilities but their behavior their general emotional state but we kind of just forget about the older dogs and put all the effort into the younger ones julian julian i think there's hope for us yet i know i was just yeah. I was gonna say I mean, could you have a chat to my wife anita because i think uh, yeah. i think she might pick up a few tips to, to you know, well you say that you make, say make that. me and less geriatric the, the, the whole point in training is that you know you reward the behavior you want or give them an alternative behaviour, I thought, I can use this on my husband. And I thought, okay, what do I really want him to stop doing? I really want that toilet seat down. So I thought, okay, I sat myself down. I said, okay, instead of having a go at him for not putting it down, wait until he puts it down and then re- positively reinforce him for putting that toilet seat down. Six months later, I'm still waiting for him to put it down. Um, so I can actually positively reinforce him putting it down. So I'm rethinking that plan, but <laughs> we'll we'll work on that. But I'm sure positive. I know a lot of dog trainers use it on their kids to positively reinforce the things. Seat, if you leave the toilet seat down, it doesn't drip dry. Oh, Julian! Sorry, have I have I missed That's the point? So gross. You yeah, guys are yeah, so you, gross. You, you've, you've missed the point there, but <laughs> I missed the point. I'm sorry. Of, well, I, that's, I want, that's Julian, 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 Julian. We should take advantage of this situation. Mm. What? what? As a couple of old dogs, as a couple of old dogs. If you, if you and I were old dogs, mm. Mm. yeah. Um, in fact, I've, I've got a joke about that. Go on, then. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. going to do the joke. As, as, as a couple of old dogs here, are you okay. ready? Knock, knock. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. I'm so glad I've got my headphones in and my dogs couldn't hear you. <laughs> or you would have got a real life reenactment. No, we ne- we've never got to the punchline of that joke. We haven't. <laughs> <laughs> we love that joke. Oh, dear. <laughs> I don't know. Done done live without a, without a retake as well. It's amazing. Oh. Wait, the number of times we've tried that joke. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got a CPD certificate. Have you? I think I think it's oh. yeah. Let's have a look at your CPD certificate because I think we've we've learned a lot tonight. I, I actually want go. to learn a lot more, to be honest. But well, we could we could go whoops, we could go on and on, couldn't we? We, we could go on and on and on. So it says it says got? certificate of responsible CPD. Quite right too. Oh. This yeah. certifies that Mike and Julian have been frightfully grown up little soldiers. Well, till the above <laughs> all, professional. Yeah, yeah. I missed the R Absolutely. out. Absolutely, I missed the R <laughs> out. It's a po- professional. Yeah. Oh dear! Yeah, okay. all, all it's like a part of bag this. instead of a Prada bag. <laughs> <laughs> and just just to explain some of the some of the pictures, here's here's my cat who um, uh, I've engineered to make it look as if he's writing a letter. Nice. There's there's my sister's dog licking a plate, which I think is very good behaviour. And there's she's my dog. She's the bowl. She's already a step ahead. A she's, she's, she's ditched the, the bowl. dog bowl. Yeah. There's there's uh, my my aunt's dog is looking uh, very proud and happy. There's the African hunting dog that uh, presumably is one of the uh, antecessors of uh, of all of our dogs. Uh, and there's there's a, a bumblebee, uh, not for any particular reason, and a tapir. Not for any particular reason, and a jolly nice um, case of of Margot that someone gave me 
uh, not for any uh, thing other than, I think, obviously, don't self-medicate, but wine taken in moderation isn't a bad thing. And no, also, because I heard you're a bit of a foodie, Anita, and, and I was hoping if we had more time to chat about food, but there's a there's a wedding cake I made for my uh, my head nurse a few years back. A wedding oh, cake. Nice. With, you know, it's a wedding cake with a difference. Wedding cake is made out of cheese layers. Oh, wow. <laughs> I love cheese. So, <laughs> you had me at cheese. <laughs> 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 so so there we go um that's that's the cbd certificate you are you are into cooking though aren't you yeah you yeah, know i love cooking and i love feeding <laughs> Excellent. I, i'm really bad like i'm not good at like it's just my husband and i but i'm terrible at making a meal just for two like it's just not a skill that i have um or my people invite me somewhere for a holiday and my best friends used to and i'm like oh you think I can cook for everyone? <laughs> and they're always like, please, please cook. Like, no one wants to cook. The fact that we all went on a hen's weekend, I'm like, oh, can I be in charge of all the food? Like, <laughs> let me be in charge of the food. Like, I love, yeah, I like, I really like feeding. I, I never used to be in uni. Pe- my friends used to always make fun of me because <laughs> I clip on like chocolate and microwave popcorn. Or when I finally like moved out, my I'd go home every weekend because I'd drive home because I worked at a vet clink and um, my mum would cook me meals for the week and I'd come back with a week's worth of meals. So until I graduated uni, I never cooked. Like I could cook, but I never cooked. Like I mm. think mum liked to cook for me. Um, but yeah, it was like microwave popcorn and cake mix and chocolate. That's basically what I lived on. Um, <laughs> that turned out I right. <laughs> well, look, you'll, you'll, um, you'll appreciate what I'm doing tomorrow then because we've got a street party. So uh, our oh, neighbours, yeah. we're having a party, and I, I'm I'm cooking for uh, for, for twenty five people. I'm cooking uh, a paella and uh, and a vegetarian tagine, all on oh, a nice. fire pit. There's my challenge oh, for tomorrow. Cool. Cook both of those on a on a fire pit for twenty five people. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. That's good amazing. Well, I hope the weather's good for you. So do I. Otherwise, it'll be a rather <laughs> rather raw paella. On the flip noise. side, I'm hoping the weather's lousy because I'm vaccinating tomorrow. Ah. <laughs> what are you doing tomorrow, Anita? Oh, uh, what am I doing tomorrow? I've oh, I've got a plumber coming around. That's super exciting because we bought a house and we only moved in about six weeks ago, and so we're renovating it. My husband mm. and I like we. There's nothing you can't learn on YouTube. Um, so we've finished two rooms <laughs> so far, but. Uh, we've got a plumber coming in to help us look at redesigning the the bathroom. So it's um, yeah, <laughs> you can't see the other side of the camera, but it's basically a construction site. <laughs> Did you do the plastering behind you? Uh, well, that's a window blind. <laughs> ah, well, there we go. I was going to say it's totally it's totally uh, smooth plastering. <laughs> yes, but we have we did on the other bedrooms. Yeah, we um the plastering and yeah everything good for you that's fantastic mm. that's absolutely excellent fabulous. Ah, very good i i, I learned how to plaster on on, uh, on youtube but i, ru- I ruined my laptop <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> it was like dad joke central <laughs> <laughs> and, and talking of jokes i've got a i've got a uh, a joke <laughs> now i know i know mike's done one mike 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 did his dog joke but um, i won't be that was serious. I won't be put off from doing my joke. I was being no, serious. No. I've got a joke. No, 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 no. I was hoping I'd get food treats from Anita. And, and yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> you can do a joke, Julian. Presumably, Anita will send us food treats through the post. Yeah, absolutely. With, with a series of simple yet um, uh, formative instructions on how to gain those treats. Yes, yeah, so, so I'll send that part uh, to your uh, wife, and then she'll have the drinks for you. I what I what I try to I, so I, I usually tell a joke about this this time of the year, the show, and uh, most people they like them, and I usually try and get a joke to link in to whatever subjects we've had, but um, uh, I couldn't think of one to link in, so I'm, I'm not going to do a link in joke. What I'm going to do is a joke that I, I heard a little while back about um, about the Pope. And uh, the Pope uh, was uh, making a visit to uh, to Australia, and um, 
and he, he the visit goes well. He has a great time and meets lots of people. And then he's he's flying home, and his chauffeur, not deterred by the speed limit, arrives at the airport super early. And the Pope says, "Well, that was great. But, you know, we're here. I don't know why Pope sounds Jewish, but anyway, well, I don't know why we're here early. But uh, you know, well, we, we've got half an hour to spare." He said, uh, "Could I ask you something?" And the chauffeur says, "Yeah, mate." He said, "Can, can I?" Can I ask you? I haven't driven for 55 years. And I used to drive everywhere. Could I could I drive the car? He says, yeah, sure, mate. You can get in there, get in the, the front, I'll hop in the back, you drive the car. Thank you, my son. That's very, very kind. I'd, I'd like to do that. So he, he, um, he gets behind the wheel and he's very old and doddery and he, he's waving all around the road as he goes along. And this policeman sees him and he thinks, oh, I'm nicking him. I have him. Blimey, he must be drunk or something. So he woo, 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 whatever noise the, uh, the Australian police yeah, call. far off that. Yeah. yeah. And he pulls <laughs> him over to the side and he comes up, he rats on the window and the, the, the Pope pulls the window down. He says, look, mate, I don't know what you... Oh, oh my goodness. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Holy Father. Uh, excuse me. And he runs back to his police car and he gets on the... Uh, uh, the, 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 the Whatever it is, two-way system, the walkie-talkie. And he says... He says Captain, I've got a real problem. He says, I just pulled someone over and they're like, you know, they're really important, really famous. And his controller says, well, that's Tom Cruise. He says, no, 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 it's big, you know, really, really big, really important. What, do you mean it's sort of Boris Johnson? No, 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 it's big, it's big. Does the Queen come to visit? Queen Queen Elizabeth come? No, 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 no. This, this is huge. Well, I mean, who is it? Can you tell me? Look, I, I don't know, mate, but let's put it this way. The Pope is driving him. <laughs> okay, Julian. Yeah, I'll get my coat. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think it's nearly bedtime. <laughs> it's past my bedtime. <laughs> and it must be getting past your bedtime, Anita. We've kept you up. I'm sure we have. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I think all it, all it leaves us to say is that if you've liked or enjoyed what you've heard or listened to or seen, um, just remember to share with all your friends, click like, subscribe to any of the channels and uh, come and join us. And if you've got any feedback for us or you want us to delve into any other subjects, I mean, it's been a hell of a, hell of a session with Anita this evening, um, then please let us know and we'll do our best to, uh, to accommodate you. So um, all it leaves for us to say, I think, is Anita Dow from the mindfulpetowner.com. Thank you very, very much indeed for sharing some incredible insights into, into your life and the, the amazing work that you do. And uh, I'll raise a glass. May your dog go with you. May your dog go with you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. You're very, very welcome. Cheers, Anita. Thank you. Cheers. Um, I can't cheers water. I think that's illegal in my country. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be drummed out. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and cut. Excellent. Oh, brilliant. Oh, Anita. That was, a, that was incredible. Wow. <sighs> Thank you so much. What a, what a lot. That was brilliant. Save the How was it? Last. Last. That was awesome. Thank Your you. CPD, it was 60 fun. second CPD was one of the best. Have you, have you enjoyed it? Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's been a blast. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Absolutely it's been lots of fun. Wow, mind blown! You know, yeah, as, as old Excellent. dogs, as old dogs, <laughs> learning new tricks. Wow! Absolutely, the, the paradigm has truly been shifted. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. I, I thank you awesome. very much. For that. That's that's my goal. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs>